All right, guys, we are live. We're back. Another live podcast. We're also going to be streaming to our Facebook page to take some questions from you. And this entire podcast, this entire episode, this entire debate is going to be about fishing hooks. I am Joe Simons. Lick Diamonds. Who else do we got here on the board? We got Luke Simons over here. Lick Diamonds. Got Mark Goodson. Like Goodson. <laughs> yeah, Wyatt Parcell. Like Bill Parcell. All right, guys. We're missing Tony. Tony's actually out in the water filming an insider report, some new insider tips. So you insiders, you're going to get to see where Tony is fishing this week. And um, I think it's going to be a pretty cool surprise. So if you're not an insider, <laughs> oh, boy, you're missing out. And talking about being an insider, saving 20% off everything, let's talk about hooks. We've been looking at, you know, at our shop page and we see what sells. There's a lot of different hooks, right, from a lot of different brands. And I think there's a lot of confusion on there about, what, you know, when you need to use certain hooks, which hooks are better, which brands better uh, in, in certain instances, because there's, if there's just one best brand, they would always be winning. Uh, so, and uh, Mark, you have more experience with that when working in the tackle industry. So where do you guys want to start this? Do you want to go basic? To talk about all the different types. I know why you came prepared, right? And you have, have them all somewhere there on your desk? Yeah, I've got pretty much every kind of hook you could imagine right here. I mean, what do we want to start with? Yeah, let's, let's maybe, maybe, yeah, let's show each one and then we'll maybe uh, go into some comparisons and, and debates. And, uh, and you guys post your questions too if you are watching this live on the FB. Hopefully we're streaming. I can't even see when I'm on the Zoom. <laughs> We are live. Nice. Locked and loaded. Gregory, Gregory Ramco will post something hopefully moderately <laughs> appropriate uh, here before too long. All right, I see us on my phone. Cool. Awesome. Why cool. Let, let's start shallow to deep, man. Let's, let's start with the skinny water hooks first. That sounds good to me. So let's go ahead and start with one of our favorites, the owner twist lock. So as you guys can see here, it's just, you know, Typical weedless hook, um, and it's got the weight right there on the shaft. So hey, don't don't hold that thing too tight. It's gonna burn you, baby. That thing is hot. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a this is probably one of the best shallow water hooks you could have out there. Um, it, it's just you know this weight keeps it uh, the bait centered as you're retrieving it. It just moves really well through the water column. There's tons of different you know size and weight options, and, and you can obviously play with those. But what sets these apart from other hooks? is this cool little spring right here with the centering pin. You can put this in a soft plastic and it's, you know, it's gonna keep it in place. Uh, you don't have to rig it like, you know, a, a weedless worm, you gotta go through the head and everything like that. It's, you just stick this in there, screw the bait on and you can put it right through the body of the lure. So. Yeah, and, that, and that hook is specific for rigging like a soft plastic. That's, uh, that's, not, that's not a live bait hook. You don't, you don't, you wouldn't screw that thing into like a shrimp or a, pin, a pin fish head. That specific. So I, I think a lot of people thought would assume hook conversation would be about rigging up, you know, natural baits. But it, knowing the hooks for artificial lures is extremely important as well. Yeah, and we're gonna go over both. This is this is live bait and soft plastic and hard baits. We're gonna talk about trebles versus inline hooks, etc. Absolutely. Yeah, I've definitely got some live bait hooks here, and we'll talk about those in a second. As we start to move, you know, there are other soft plastic hooks that you can use that'll keep your bait, you know, in line that are weedless. As you can see you'd be able to put like a, a weedless uh, bait on here, and it would, this, I believe this is the must-add grip pin. Tons of different lures like this that function the same way that are going to hold, um, or I'm sorry, hooks that would function the same way, going to hold that soft plastic right there. But as we start to look a little bit more, we've also got jig heads. So these aren't weedless. Uh, your, your lure is just gonna sit, you know, right on these little hook keepers. These are some of our favorite jig heads out there, these trout eye jig heads. I believe this is actually the redfish eye. Uh, the longer shank is what separates the trout eye from the redfish eye. Um, and that longer shank is good uh, because if you've got, you know, a really long swim bait, um, you don't want, you know, a smaller trout eye to be sitting closer up to the head of the lure. It's not gonna give it great action. You just want the tail to be kicking. You don't want the whole body to wobble. So if you're using, you know, the four and the five inch, um, you know, swim baits like uh, the, the diesel minnows, uh, you're definitely going to want to use like a redfish eye. If you've got, you know, some of the smaller three inches, the trout eyes are probably going to be your best bet. You guys uh, agree with that? I, I use the trout eye for all of them. I, uh, I, I just, I, I like the extra action that the soft plastic, the freedom that the soft plastic has, and then both of them work. Um, 
I just, I just rather, I use mostly three, four inchers, but even when I go up to five, I'll just still use the same thing. A big fish, if the big fish you're targeting hits it, it's going to eat the whole thing and it's going to get hooked up. You might miss some of the smaller fish that are, that are pecking at the tails, but uh, so far in the underwater footage, if you're talking about like sea trout, even the small trout, they will go for the head every time. That, that never do they go for the tail. So you won't miss all that many. Um, so you go either way. Yeah, these, these predator fish, they're trying to kill and destroy yeah. that, that entire bait. They want it in their belly. Yeah, puffers, oh, yeah. puffers and pinfish are the ones that go for the tail. The predator fish go for the head. But, um, you know, having that bigger hook will, will increase, uh, I'm sure, will increase the odds of getting the hook up. And especially if you're using, like, the thicker baits where there's a lot of plastic involved, then using the smaller hook is going to be bad because there's a lot of plastic that can prevent the hook from getting in the fish's mouth. So the more plastic there is, the more of an advantage the longer hook has. I just rarely use like really big swim baits. So I just stick with the smaller one. Yeah. yeah. I saw words I saw, out of my mouth as well. <laughs> I saw a question came in from Chris Lewis. He was saying, what's the opinion on the chin lock hooks? So this is the chin lock hook right here. And obviously the one that's going to go up against is these owner twist locks. I, it really depends on the type for me and you guys can weigh in as well. It really just depends on the type of soft plastic I'm using. So if I'm using, you know, zoom, um, or if I'm using gulp, I'm going to go for this owner twist lock, any kind of softer, uh, you know, paddle or paddle tail fluke, any kind of soft plastic I'm going to use that's not made of the 10 X, the really tough soft plastic material. I'm going to go with these because it's, it's probably one of the fastest rigs. Um, and it just keeps it, you know, right in line the way that you want it. You don't have to worry about rigging it the wrong way. If I'm using Z-Mans, I like these a lot more because, you, you know, the whole Z-Man material can be pulled over these. Um, and with the twist locks, it's really hard to get that centering pin uh, through the Z-Man material. It can definitely still be done, and I've definitely done it and caught fish doing it that way. Um, but if I'm using, you know, the I know Strike King has a similar material. It's not – I don't believe it's the, the 10X, but it's very close. I will use these, uh, these chin locks for that. But I, I do think if I had to choose between the two – if I wanted a weedless application, I'd just go for a softer bait with a, a gulp fluke or a zoom fluke, and I'd choose these. Or you guys, Alabama uh, leprechaun. There you go. I've caught some flounder using these, actually, within the past uh, past couple weeks. I'll have a video up on that here soon. And they definitely work really well for all species. I, I totally agree with that. So, yeah, the, the chin lock I only use. Like, I'll use that if I'm only using Z-Man baits, you know, with the elastic material because it's incredibly strong. And it's, it's a, it'll, it'll rig great right on those hooks. It's, it's tough to rig on the twist locks. But if I'm using, if I'm switching around with brands, then I'll, I'll always use that twist lock because it can be used with everything. Um, it's not, it's a little bit of a pain to rig on the twist, on the, on the uh, Z-Man material, but it's still doable. You just have to dig the pilot hole. And we have a video on that. If once you do the pilot hole, Mark, you taught me that trick actually yeah. uh, back in the store years ago. And that was a game changer because I, I didn't like Z-Man material first because I couldn't rig it. Um, and so anyhow, so I saw another question come in on this topic. Wanted to hit up uh, Francisco uh, asked about if the one eighth ounce um, weight is what we recommend for the Slam Shady. And uh, yes, uh, so both of them work. Uh, I've been testing them out, and uh, and Tony is the one who found that one eighth ounce because now they make it in a three out size. I prefer the three out size hook for the Slam Shadies, the three point five or less, um, and it's awesome. The one eighth ounce is the way to go. You can cast it further. You're still weedless, and there's really no no really disadvantage. It's a and little bit to be clear for everyone. You're talking about the owner twist lock hook on the one eight. Uh, really, both of them. I say either one because this one sixteenth ounce is still works. It skips a little bit better, but just the casting distance is is helped by the extra weight. And there and the only con is that you can't skip quite as well, but it still gets, skips pretty pretty good. So I've now switched to all one eighth ounce weights for my swim baits when rigged weedless. Shane, speaking of that, Shane Harrison says, what's your choice of weedless hooks? Those two, those two right there that Wyatt had. Yeah. yeah. And even the ones that Wyatt, yeah, hold on, yeah. So those two are actually my favorite brands in those style hooks too. So the owner twist lock being a brand and then the Mustad grip pin hooks being a brand. That's the two brands and style hooks that I have most confidence in on the weedless side. You guys, do you guys are ever using the um, and the actual like weed guard? Like I know the uh, the Z-Man slash I Strike has one with the actual weedless weed guard, and then they have the Texas side. What do you think? Those are jig heads. Now we're talking jig heads. Yeah. Um, 
weight, weighted hooks, it's, it's the, those two. But they have, uh, Z-Man came out with the one called the chin lock, which is basically the same thing as the Mustad grip pin. It's the same premise. Um, I like that better for catch and release. The Mustad has really long barb. And so for catch and release fishing, it's, it's not the best for the fish. And you can, um, you can lose some hook strikes because that barb is like, it's abnormally, it's abnormally long. You can probably see it there. Um, and so the other hooks just have a smaller barb. And so I just prefer those because I do most, like right now we can't keep redfish, snook, or trout. Um, so better to, be, but even if you do it, you just, just get some pliers and squeeze it down. Um, but as far as we're going to go to jig heads, um, yes, I definitely have used the, um, both of them. They both work. And the Texas eye was my favorite for a while, but then I was dock fishing and I couldn't skip it. I realized I couldn't skip it nearly as good as the normal, the normal weed guard. Uh, but they both work. And that's, Z, that's Z man, right? For both of them. Uh, well, Z man makes Z man's the only one I've seen that makes the Texas eye. There's a t like mission fishing. There's a lot that make the weedless with the I actually have some here, but the weedless with the actual little uh, little barbs. Let me go grab one. What was what was the top selling in the store, Mark? Uh, mission and and uh, Z man both were very very well received. The, the cool thing about those Texas eye jig heads, I love them here, especially because I'm fishing around a lot of oysters and sometimes I'm throwing up into the marsh grass. You got to throw up in the marsh, especially at high tide. You know, those, those redfish, they're going to be pushing up in there. They're going to be looking for, you know, the crabs and the snails that are, that are up in there. You'll see them tailing and you can actually get reds. If you toss that, that Texas eye in there, I've caught fish right up in the marsh grass doing that. Um, I, I don't think you got my joke. Why I was, I was, it came off. You were saying throwing up. Uh, <laughs> of like like regurgitating. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, oh, gotcha. He's chumming up. He's chumming up the waters. No, that works too. That works too. But uh, throwing up. Watch the words. You got to watch your words around Joe. That's right. <laughs> but Luke. that uh, that jig head on that Texas eye, it articulates, and if you give it a really quick pop, it'll it'll actually make a click, just like a shrimp is when it flees. It'll. It's a really nice little click. Yeah, the only downside, I think, to the Texas eye, and, and this is something that I started to do, I don't know if you've ever seen those little latex, little circular disc that will hold the bait up on the bend of that hook. But if you do any kind of skipping with the Texas eye, the bait will naturally start coming down the bend of that shaft of the shank of the hook. And if you don't put that little latex disc underneath the bait where the bend is, that bait is going to continuously fall down that shank. And that's that's one of the downsides. If if you use it right, it's it's dynamic hook. Yeah. So here it is for those who don't know what it is. So the, this is the Texas eye, and basically what it is, it's a jig head that has a old school worm hook, basically attached to it. So it has freedom of motion. Um, this one is the the Z-Man one, so it has that that little knob there. That again, that I only like for Z-Man material. So I use this. I don't like this so much for non ZMA material because that barb will break and tear um, a normal oil-based soft plastic. So great for ZMA materials. Uh, if you're not skip casting, if you are skip casting or using any other materials, then I recommend going with the traditional weedless jig head, which has this little wire and you basically rig it up normally. The wire covers it and you're good to go, you're weedless, fish strikes it, wire in, engages, and now you're, you're hooked up. So I, I, when I'm dock fishing, I'm always using this because this skips much better um, than the weedless, or sorry, than the Texas eye. Uh, but if I'm covering oyster beds, like areas with a lot of oysters that I'm, I've wanted to kind of skim it up over the, over the ground, over some sort of structure, then this is awesome. Well, let's hear the yeah. clacking. So Clack. It's, it's not loud enough to make a make it. All right, why it's talking about how good, great it clacks? Let's hear. You can clack. you can definitely click it. You just just pull it pull it. And you you'll okay. hear it. Yeah, that's no like hit like like nail it. Well, well that doesn't, doesn't happen. Problem. It doesn't happen in the real world. Like it's uh it's uh, I think it's a uh, it's very slight. It's not going to pick up when I'm 10, 10 inches away on my on my uh if I put it right on like why it's microphone it probably would sound. Mm. So here it is. Here, I'll put it right next to my speaker. Yeah. Oh, very shrimp-like. Very shrimp-like. I, dude, I, I'd eat it right now. 
<laughs> now, Luke, do you glue any of your baits to the to the barb keeper itself to make sure that that plastic doesn't slide? No, I don't. I've heard of people doing it, um, but yeah. I, I just I personally don't. Um, uh, but yeah, I know I know people do. And swear I'll by tell it. you the cra the craziest thing that we saw uh, two weeks ago. Luke and I went down to fish in the Everglades, and our boy Marcos from Brazil. All of a sudden, it wasn't just a lighter, it was like a flamethrower. He brings out like a literally like a handheld torch and he starts torching the top of the jig head right there with the head. And you know, obviously heats it up pretty hot and then slides that uh it's very similar to Z-Man kind of material, and it almost kind of like burns and all like it's not never coming off again. That wasn't uh, and, yeah, don't don't do that for Z-Man. So that wasn't a Z-Man material. Um, was, that was it was similar to Z-Man material, meaning it was kind of tough to get on there but once you kind of melt it on uh that was the first time i'd ever seen that and no i would not recommend that at all uh especially now in the everglades i would not recommend even bringing a torch on your uh, on your boat <laughs> yeah for for the, for the record that was a uh, resin based material so that's something that's that's um that's very unique and it's it's it's, it's one made down in brazil um so yeah don't don't i don't recommend flame flame throwing your uh, your baits to it to rig it up just a normal normal rigging gets the job done some glues do work some people do swear by the glue if you do the glue method definitely get a quick drying glue of some sort because otherwise you're going to sit there and have to wait for it to dry or the reason why i don't like glue is because any sort of scent like most glues that i've used at least has a pretty strong odor and i can't imagine that would help for fish being attracted to it. <laughs> Luke, that brings up scent tracks. It's going to be one of our upcoming podcast episodes talking about all the different scents, both the good ones and the bad ones that actually attract fish. Uh, I think you guys will be blown away with, uh, with, with all the discoveries that have happened uh, over the years on what scents actually attract and detract fish. Uh, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, all right, so what else we got, Wyatt? We didn't make it through the first couple of hooks and now a couple of jig heads. Where are we on? on yeah, the, so, I so some, a couple of live bait questions too. So we're going to make sure you hit those up. Yeah, we'll hit those in a second because you've also got something. You, I guess this is the, the shallowest because it sits, you know, a foot uh, or less than a foot under the, the surface of the water, but you got your, your treble hooks. You find these on a lot of lures, especially your top waters. Um, you know, one really important thing to look at for your 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 top water trebles got a bunch of people calling me right now oh my goodness wait it's probably travis asking why you trimmed your beard he said you guys look like a bunch of girls he can't be talking about luke and i mine yeah, still looks not, fresh not me i'm still going strong travis bell why'd you why'd you shave yours mark and why well mine was a two-part thing number one um, it, it was a before and after weight loss challenge that I'm going to. And number two, I have to do the, the, the chemo cream on the cheek here. So wait a minute. Shouldn't the weight, like, shouldn't you take the picture when you're heavier with the big beard? Cause it's going to make you look thinner. When you <laughs> no, because from the side view, you know, you'll see all the double chins and everything. So I'll, I want to take the fattest picture I can in the beginning just so i can make myself feel a lot better like three weeks down the road <laughs> all right sorry why what's your excuse for the beard oh well i uh I, I don't know how to maintain a beard this is my first time trying it out I, yeah I, I trimmed it a little too Wyatt, short this is live dude don't admit I, it. I gotta be honest i've started trying to grow one out i've always been clean shaven but you know since i started teaching people about fishing i feel like you're more trustworthy if you got the beard if you <laughs> notice luke catches more fish when he's got a beard so i had to start growing one out Mark's, Mark's excuse was way better your dog doesn't like your excuse yeah your, do your dog is like i'm calling his bluff on that one that's pitiful Oh, he's still muted. It, it, You're gonna be doing it. Your microphone doesn't even agree with him. He's yeah. going crazy right now. But uh, these these carbon hooks, uh, you know, these steel carbon hooks right here, versus these black nickel hooks. My dog is going insane right now. But uh, the, these carbon steel hooks versus these black nickel hooks. The black nickel hooks are a lot better for preserving uh, the actual integrity of the hook. You know, fighting against rust and everything. These carbon steel ones, they've got the exact same strength level, but uh, in, in terms of rust, they, they're going to rust a lot faster. So, you know, your treble hooks uh, it really doesn't seem to matter in terms of 
you know, like I said, uh, strength. But if you want to you wanna prevent rust from building up on your hooks, you're definitely going to need to have uh, those black nickel hooks. And I, I just like those for my top waters in general. Have you guys noticed anything different? I just, I just like the, you know, invention of the single replacement hooks, you know, for, for baits like that, you know, and Luke, you know, I know that he's going to be, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that, you know, we've talked a lot about this on camera, off camera, and, um, you know, he's, he's got a lot of footage that, you know, there's not a lot of miss, you know, missed strikes, you know, on the small fish side, you know, it's kind of helped them out there, but on the big fish hookups, it's been pretty legit. And I just, I just know it to be a lot safer. You know, I've used a lot of them on the really, really deep offshore stuff for a lot of the heavy, heavy trolling lures. So I know how much safer they are on big baits, big fish. Um, but, but I know I, I, I can at least say that I know that Luke has really traded his trebles out for those singles. Yeah, and it's basically, because um, I've been using this now for, I've been, you know, I've had Otis now four years, and he's he's known to chase lures around, and so just for his safety, I've started using these, uh, the single inline hooks, and I've been blown away by them. They, they are much more weedless, so for areas like uh, over here in Florida, we have a lot of seagrass, and especially in the summertime, which is my favorite time to do top water, there's a lot of floating seagrass, and this will mathematically you can guarantee that you snag less grass when you're when you're fishing areas with uh with seagrass floating around um, as mark said i have i have seen a decrease in strikes only when the fish is small and Wait, i think that's a right, good strikes thing. or hookups uh sorry hookups so, yeah. yes the hookup ratio yeah thanks for clarifying uh different strike i haven't seen any difference in the amount of strikes i get I have seen the same, I've seen a decrease in the hookup ratio when smaller fish are hitting, but when it's a bigger fish, they're gonna suck it down. And if a fish puts this in its mouth and you get a hook set, you're gonna hook it. And also what I've seen is that when I do hook up, I feel like I have less fish getting off because in my opinion, it's the force of the hookup is now going to a maximum of two points. Whereas, you know, if, if all six points somehow were, were uh, impacting the fish, just that, that power of the hook set is just getting spread around a, a lot. Do you, think so, the, yeah. do you think the rust on that back one helps or hurts? Uh, I think it helps a little bit. You know, you gotta, gotta have it a little natural. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but anyhow, so yeah, first thing I do when I get a new plug is I take off the trebles and I put singles. And uh, again, it's obvious, again, for another reason, the fact that we're, a lot of fish I'm catching are snook, redfish, sea trout. Uh, we can't keep those now, so it's better for the fish. It's better for uh, me, safer for Otis, and and I really haven't seen a decrease in fish. And and uh, I've had multiple times when uh, little ladyfish and small trout are up there popping at it, and they keep missing, they keep missing, and I'm fortunately, and then a bigger fish will come in. It'll hear, hear the commotion. It'll come up and just get the easy meal, and and I would in that case I caught the better fish when otherwise I would have caught the the pesky ladyfish. Uh, now on the replacement hooks, Luke, you know, the traditional size trebles, you're looking at a size six, size four, size two. All right, so those are the three basic sizes of trebles. Do you do the automatic replacement for that size or do you increase one hook size because you're going to a single? I don't even, I don't even pay, I don't even know that, because like when I buy a lure, it doesn't say what size treble. I have no idea what size trebles are. I just look at the bait. And, uh, and so for like, this is the bigger skitter walk, I use a uh, two watt. And then for Super Spook Juniors, which I use a lot, I use a, a one watt. Okay. And then for mirror lures, I use a one. And those are, those are like the really three that I use. And I, and I put a link, um, we have a post, we can put a link down below in the description that I just got the most popular hard plastic lures and put the, 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 the size hooks that, uh, that seem to go well. And what I've right. found too is I've, I've gone smaller and I've gone bigger and it, there's not a huge difference. So you don't have to get it perfect. It's uh, the, the thing that you have to make sure you don't do is don't get them so big so that they can hook each other. They can hook onto each other. As long as they don't hook onto each other or like hook around the nose, another problem that could happen, then you're good. You're good to go. Luke, yeah, I know on the owner. Go for it, Mark. I know on the owner hooks, the single eye replacement package, it'll say if you have this size treble, then you use this size single place, you know, hook. 
So if you do know the treble size that is on the lure that you're replacing, they do have that conversion chart on the package. Yeah, and what Wyatt said about the type of hook, I, I believe that is true throughout, whether it's trebles or anything, um, as far as the, the coating, um, where strength doesn't matter. Um, clearly some rust does happen, but uh, that was probably me in a hurry and I didn't wash it down very good. <laughs> so just like any hook, just make sure you take care of them, they last longer. Yeah, make sure to save those trebles, dude. That's like sterling silver for the bass guys. I think if you <laughs> if you put a little package together, get some 50-pound braid treble hooks, dude, they will be buying that left and right. Yeah, we, 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 don't use, we don't use single, uh, you know, the single hook replacements, and we don't use spinning rods. <laughs> or 10-pound braid. Bass guy be like, what's that? <laughs> that for <Sure>. fish? <laughs> Too light. It's too light. <laughs> oh, and uh, Chris Lewis had asked, do we have uh, fishing tips for Jacksonville, Florida? Absolutely. Uh, we can talk with you uh, afterwards. But, yeah, I mean, the, the whole club started, you know, in Florida. So the whole state of Florida is covered. If you go look at that map or any of the – we actually got a really cool video coming up next week on the 90-10 the fishing rule uh, where we do show the map. We show three really cool case studies. And, I mean, the map in Florida is – I mean, it's so covered up it ain't even funny. Uh, from the Panhandle all the way down to you know, Miami up to up to Jacksonville and, and getting into Savannah. And then it goes all the way up to really Virginia. We have, we have because of John Skinner, you know, joining, uh, joining the team and, and doing some of these courses, we've attracted a lot of people in the Northeast. But prior to that, it really kind of stopped at Virginia. Um, you know, what, what we specialize in in terms of our club is, is the inshore of saltwater fishing. We have Captain Dylan Hubbard, one of our coaches, does some of the nearshore and offshore. But 90% of the content seems to be around inshore fishing, you know, redfish and speckled trout, snook here in, in Florida and parts of Texas, flounder, tarpon, black drum, mangrove, snapper, spanish, mackerel. I could keep going on and on. Uh, but yeah, we can uh, talk to you about that uh, off, uh, off, offline. Um, Luke, Michael asked, where's the portrait hanging of Otis these days? Yeah, I just saw that and check this out. Oh! So <laughs> So uh, Michael's have been a member for a while and he mentioned that he just started drawing and, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I take Otis out a lot. He, he's like, hey, send me a picture of Otis and I'll, I'll sketch him out. And so I, you know, I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't know that him at that time. So I was like, sure, I didn't really expect anything to come out of it. And, he, and then he reached out later. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm down on vacation uh, down in Florida. He was down in uh, Bradenton. And he's like, if you can swing on by. And so I swung by and he gave this to me. Like, this is hand drawn. Like, this is amazing. That's awesome. And, uh, oh, totally blown away. And at this point, he had just started drawing. Like, he, he was teaching his son how to draw. And uh, and just like kind of started just picking it up. And like this was like shortly after he even started doing it. He's, it is amazing. I'd say you amazing. have a gift, Michael, that uh, even after maybe a decade of lessons, I could not do that. Yeah, it's amazing. So thank you. Thank you again. That was uh, absolutely amazing. So yeah, it's on the wall. I just, that's why I went up and got it. I, uh, I saw that comment come in. So yeah, it's, uh, it's always on the wall. Luke, uh, before we get into some of the live bait uh, hooks, will you share what happened last night with uh, Otis? Oh yeah. Um, so I was out. I was outside, yeah. and um, and I looked down in the grass, and it looked like a, a landmine. You know, one of Otis's landmines out there. So not not anything too too abnormal. But then I saw something white sticking out of it, and uh, I said, like, "Oh, that's not good." And, and you, a landmine means poop, right? Yeah, yeah, landmine means, uh, uh, yeah, it's a landmine for stepping in it, you know. <laughs> I don't want to step on it. I just got to clarify with Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> and so I look closer, and I can see a paddle tail sticking up out of the stinking poop. And uh, sure I hope that's not the paddle tail. What's that? I hope that's not the paddle tail. No, yeah, this is the same one. It's uh... <laughs> And so sure enough, he's thinking that he pooped out a paddle tail. And then I look closer and uh, I was like, what's, uh, that's like, what's green in there? And so we had an Alabama leprechaun in there too, right next to the paddle tail. <laughs> we had a Slam Shady and a leprechaun and, uh, and, and one little turd. That was, I, I was like mad at first. And then I went to like being pretty impressed because like, what are the odds? And there, there is a video on our Instagram page right now that you guys can all see of a uh, of, of landmine. Oh, that's hilarious. All right, so you want to pivot? Why? you got some more hooks to share and talk about that we can talk about. Uh, anything else that people want to know? Best brands, 
Uh, I, I saw someone mention uh, sharpening hooks. That's a great question to talk about that. Uh, and even colors, you know, you've seen purple treble hooks and all these different colors. What the heck does that mean? So uh, what do we got, Wyatt? Yeah, so we'll talk about the live bait hooks first, and then I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about colors and brands because I've been doing a lot of research lately uh, on hooks and coatings and things like that. But these are going to be, um, you know, my actually, it's just two. There's two styles of live bait hooks that I like. This is a kale hook. This is actually what I use for a lot of my surf fishing. But if you're hooking, you know, any kind of shrimp, this is, this is one of my favorite hooks if you're going to be free lining them or putting them under a float or anything. I really like kale hooks because it's really close to what the body of a shrimp, you know, actually does. Um, so, so I'll put them on this. Uh, but if you're going to be using, you know, mullet or any kind of bait fish or anything like that, you're definitely going to be wanting a circle hook. I don't know exactly what size this is, um, but I, I know Mark knows a lot about, you know, the bottom, bottom rigs for grouper and things like that. Um, this size right here, you really just have to think about, the, the, the size of the mouth of the, the fish you're targeting. So, you know, redfish, snook, trout, this size right here might be a little bit big, but for most species, you know, on the nearshore wrecks, uh, nearshore reefs, things like that, Mark, would this, you know, work for those grouper, those snapper, things like that? Yeah. And, and another thing after you're done, you know, I want to point out the, the line tie area of both of those hooks and why those are also important to, to kind of point out. You know, on, on the kale hook, you can see how that line tie and on the octopus circle hook that in his other hand, the black hook, you see how that line tie is kind of offset. You know, those are, you know, traditionally used whenever you're going to, you know, pass the line through that hook eye and tie to the shank of the hook. So, you know, so, so that's... Now not snelling that hook yes so that's why they offset that to have more of a lineal you know a power kind of a pulling weight to it um you know as opposed to the one that i'm going to hold up on a grouper rig you know you can see how the line tie is you know straight with the shank so you know that's also very important you know to understand and and i use that hook for a particular reason any, any of the ones that Wyatt has that has the snailed hook version are ones that I use a knocker rig with so that that weight can hit the metal and produce that sound versus the one that I have here as what I'm going to use for a, a traditional, you know, no weight's going to touch this knot area or the hook area. And I use that as more of a fish finding rig or a live bait rig. So the hook tie itself is also very important. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. When I tie these these kale hooks, I use them a lot on surf rigs, and I had I made a video about pompano rigs. And when I attach these hooks, I don't tie you know a snug knot like that. Like you said, what I'm going to go ahead and do is is bring the uh, the line through the eye of the hook around the shank and pull it right back. And that's you know how I'm making my my pompano rigs, three float hook rigs. I mean, pretty much any rig that you know I'm going to have a dropper loop on. So I uh, completely agree with you there. Yeah, for so for J hooks, I used to I'd do that as well. And then a uh, cool thing I learned from Peter Deeks, um, who we, we've done some live bait courses with. And, and uh, I, I learned from him with when using J hooks. So J hooks, I don't know if we covered it, but J hooks are, are ideal, or I guess the, the better bet if you're actively fishing, if, if you're actively fishing a live bait, which is what Deeks teaches, where he's going out and catching some giant fish, but he is actively making sure that the bait is looking as good as possible. He's actively feeling for strikes and he's quick to get a good hook set. J hooks are awesome. And uh, what he does, he just ties, even though it is offset, hopefully you can see it on my shirt. So the, the eye is off at an angle. It's not, it's not directly in line with the shank. It's off the angle. He still ties a normal knot. He, do, he just does a normal clinch knot. And the reason why is he says that when he sets the hook, he's tearing the hook out of the bait fish and he wants that hook point to be angled up to have a better chance of, of hooking into the, you know, the mouth of the fish. And so that's the, that's the situation where, um, where I've seen somebody that, uh, that is like, has like little world records recommending to not do a snell knot on one of these eyes like this. So, but if you're not actively fishing, when you're using live bait or cut bait, then don't use a J hook use a circle hook because your, your hookup ratio is going to be better and you're going to be, you're going to be, you won't be gut hooking the fish like you would with a J hook. 
Yeah, another very, very important deal. So the one that you just, you know, held up, Luke, I consider that a live bait hook, you know, that straight shank J hook style hook. I only snell my hooks when it's a circle hook and I'm going to let a bait soak. So with any time that I have direct contact with rod and reel in hand and I need to present a strike, I do not snell my hooks. It's a direct line tie snug knot. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Cool. And, and now too, just for, for anybody who's refishing, it's uh, it's an easy decision, at least in Florida. I, I don't know if it's out everywhere, but it's an easy decision what hook to use because it needs to be circle hook. If you're targeting reef species, I believe it's now the law, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you have to use circle hooks and it needs to be an inline circle hook. The offset circle hooks, it's not considered an actual circle hook because you can still have a pretty good chance of, uh, of gut hooking, let me pick one out here. So if you're wondering what an offset, yeah, why you have one, what an offset circle hook is, is it's a circle hook, I'll stand a little bit taller so you can see. So you can see that the actual hook itself is not directly in line with the shank like it is with this one. This, this one was in line, I've, I've caught some grouper with it, so it's a, little bit, it's a little bit off kilter, but you can see they're both technically circle hooks, but one of them has, is in line, Right, it's all in line, whereas one has the hook point jutting out to the side. One, one will get you in a lot of trouble. Yeah, uh, legal, it's like, like in tournaments, if it's a tournament that requires circle hooks, this, this side is illegal. Like you will get banned from the tournament, it'll get disqualified, you have to use the inline. And I believe the Florida regulations now for refishing is inline circle hooks only. But even if you are, these, I haven't seen a difference really in hookup ratio, um, so like just use these. Just get, the, if you're going to get a circle, get it in line, leave these in the store. Yeah. And that's reef and live bottom, guys. So keep that in mind. Just because it's not a marked reef, if it's a live bottom, then it's still required by law. And live bottom, I guess, what's the, what is, what would be the legal definition of that? You know, so that's one of the great things, right? You know, our, our state is kind of good at that sometimes, you know, so in anything that's growing on a live active bottom, like a coral, you know, like a coral flat offshore for red grouper, they still consider that live bottom, but not necessary reef. You know, this is one of my conversations with FWC, you know, how do you, how do you know when you're drift fishing, number one? Uh, I mean, so that there's that area that, you know, you might have started on one, but you're not on one now and you're catching fish on alternate, you know, alternate basis. So rule of thumb, just use circle. There's just too many red flags surrounding it. Yeah, do inline circle. Yeah, not just yes. circle, but inline circle. Yes. Also, too, um, Peter Deeks, our man, he has got a course. He's been working on this for I believe it's almost been a year, like legitimate, getting different footage underwater. The entire course is basically underwater and he's taken every type of live bait imaginable. You know, I, and I, you know the obvious ones, the shrimp and pinfish, and then he gets, you know, croakers and I mean, all kinds of stuff, different crabs, and he's hooking them every which way possible. So there's probably, I don't know what, four ways to rig a pinfish, maybe five if you're real creative. And he actually rigs them every single way and then takes it underwater in different types of scenarios, different currents, et cetera, and then films exactly what's happening based on that scenario. I mean, it, I think he's got like 28 videos just on shrimp alone, all different ways to rig it and what it's actually doing. And I've seen a few of the videos so far. He, he sends me some of the final ones and I'm like, holy smokes, you can learn so much from what you know from seeing it underwater what your bait actually does and, and this is mostly all live bait obviously it does a little cut bait stuff just in current but most of it's live bait and you get to see what these fish and shrimp and crabs and crustaceans and all this are actually doing it is so fascinating uh so that course will be out hopefully by august 1st is uh is the goal he's uh finalizing all of it but it, i mean it really is it's it's a year of work and terabytes and terabytes of footage and underwater uh cameras and uh, videographers it's uh it's really really cool when peter deeks who's got i think seven or eight world records when he says he learned more on this than he's ever learned anything in his life uh you know it's going to be good i don't even know what we're going to call that one yet like the underwater world of live bait or something but 
Uh, I'm so pumped for uh, everyone to, to see that. His first course, Live Bait Mastery, uh, I mean, that was one that just got rave reviews. And now uh, this one is 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 going to knock that one out of the park. It's pretty cool. So just throwing that out there for all this talk about baits and uh, and hooks. And then he goes above water and actually, you know, shows exactly how to rig them and, and kind of picks a final winner for every single scenario. So pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, the footage, the footage I've seen so far is, is amazing. It's good. It's cool. And, uh, and as far as on, on this hook, the hook theme, as far as the live bait hooks, um, I, I'd say a big problem. And, uh, at least for me is that, you know, trying to get the right size hook, um, when you're going across brands, the, it's kind of like fishing rods where like the power rating, there's not like a, a system across industry, you know, systemized rating system so a one-aught hook from one company is very likely going to be a different size than a one-aught hook from a different company and it drives me crazy so that's that's a problem where because a lot of people hey like what size hook should i get and we're like well it depends on what brand you're using and what bait you're using um so just just be uh, just be uh be aware of that so if you're if you're you know you found if you're fishing with somebody and they were using a certain size hook make sure you get the size and the brand because otherwise you might actually have end up with a different size. Speaking of brand, where y'all where y'all fishing? Gamagatsu owner Mustad. I use all three. I use like whatever, cause I just go by sight on like what size I'm looking for and whatever store I'm near that I go to, and sometimes I get which I just get whichever one has the size I'm looking for. What do you think, Mark? You you have a unique perspective because you worked, you know, in a really busy tackle store for many years and you got to, you got to see what gets returned. You got to see what people come back and say, this thing was awesome or this thing wasn't good. What are you, what are your thoughts on? Yeah. You know, I, I always saw two parallels with my commercial guys that fish for a living. They seem to have always been mustad or a heavy gauge gamagatsu. Um, so that 4X strong Gamagatsu or the traditional mustad strength of a hook was kind of where my commercial guys were. The inshore guys, it was a mix between, you know, Gamagatsu and owner. Um, those were probably the two most purchased. Um, we did entertain a fourth brand, which was VMC. And I'll tell you, um, they were great on cost, you know, for the, for the average pack of hooks. Uh, but it just didn't seem like the longevity was there um, on the hook itself. Um, they rusted so much faster than the other hook brands did. Um, I, I never saw so many broken shanks on the hooks um, outside of that brand. Um, so I, I, that was a no-go for us. But um, we stocked a full you know, complement of, of Mustad, Gamma got to an owner because we felt that those three brands pretty much own the industry. Cool. Good, uh, good Intel. Cause I know Tony, he did the same thing I did. He, he did a test, right? Luke on those single inline hooks and it was owner versus VMC. And he had the same, same problems uh, with VMC, just not, not being as high quality. Yeah. VMC is much more affordable. Um, but yeah, quality wise, um, Definitely. I haven't, I haven't tried. I actually just got to pack up just to, just to see what the difference is. Um, but I mean, I, I noticed as well that, you know, that's the price is definitely better, but uh, if the, if what I've heard about the quality is, is true, then I will be continuing my owner purchases. I, uh, and owner, owner makes a great point to the hook design, the actual, you know, beveled point, I would say it is um, versus the traditional style, you know, like on the Mustad or the Gamagatsu, where it's just a straight needle point, um, you know, so the cutting tip and surface of these hooks also matter. And, and you can really see the quality base, how that tip will get kind of knurled and curled over and it really will, will, will hurt the penetration factor on those hooks. So, you know, the, the gauge of the hook and the, and how they chemically sharpen that hook is awfully important. So which, uh, so with the owner, so I have some here, this doesn't have the bevel. This is this a straight needle point. So yeah, you, that, when you get owners, you get the, what's it called? You remember? That it's a, it's a cutting point, I think is what they call theirs. Uh, but I think the SSWs are probably one of their most popular style of hooks. 
and I saw a question come in from uh, from Peter asking about uh, changing out the treble hooks, you know, changing out the single hook and, uh, and the replacements of the trebles. And I used to struggle with it because I would get like the, the Walmart special little pliers that have the, the little hook thing. And it, it totally changed my, my life <laughs> with uh, replacing these things. Once we got, we found these scissors. And the reason why we now uh, offer these to, uh, to members is because they are amazingly good at, at uh, doing the replacement. I'll put it in that black background. The reason why is you just need to have one of these, um, you know, set of pliers or scissors like this that has a really sharp point on that little, on that little attachment. With this, this is very easy. And best of all, these are priced lower than the, you know, the cheaper Walmart things I used to get in the day. They're awesome. So if you don't have some, get some, or just go find some like it, uh, because you just want that that sharp point, and it'll be a game changer. It's super easy with uh, with a set of scissors or pliers like this. Yeah, the split ring nose cuts braid like butter. Even, uh, even it's magnetic too, which is a uh, kind of cool magnetic nose. Uh, let's talk about sharpening the hooks. Do you guys sharpen your hooks? I, uh, I've, I've got, I got a file for it a long time ago. Um, and I just, you know, I, I never really did it. Uh, I, I just think, you know, I've messed up hooks. I, I've tried it, you know, a couple times and I've messed up hooks doing it. Um, you know, I, I just think it's the wrong way with it. I, I don't know what I did wrong, and I think that's why I put it down and I never tried again. Um, maybe Mark could teach us how to, how to sharpen some hooks. I know he might have some experience in that department, but it's it's something that I think uh, – why, why would you of... assume that, Wyatt? Why would you assume Mark has experience in that? Does he worked in like a tackle sharp? shop. He worked in a tackle shop. He knows his way around terminal tackle. If I can give Mark one thing, it's he knows he knows his way around some terminal tackle. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I, – I, you know, on the competitive side – I, I just, I feel like the manufacturers make the optimum point, you know, and, and I don't want to, to change what they chemically sharpen and how they sharpen their hooks. I'm like Wyatt, even though that I, I know a little bit about terminal, I just did, I don't, I don't do a good job with the sharpeners, you know, and I try to, you know, to stay with the finest grit, you know, sharpening stone. And it just, it seems to always put some kind of weird bevel you know, on the point, and it's just never sharp like the factory would make it sharp. So, unfortunately for me, you know, I, I just I put all my hooks in a bend, and I give them to my buddies after I use them, you know, for a week or two. And I just always want to have the the, the sharpest point. And hooks aren't that expensive. I, I do. I I sharpen them when situations like this with this little crab lure. So this is um, hopefully you guys can hear. It looks like my connections becoming unstable because my neighbors are all in line right now but uh this is a hook that comes with a crab so this is like a four or five dollar crab so it's not as simple as just throwing away a, a single hook and um i'm fishing docks and every once in a while i get snagged on a dock or an oyster or something on it and the point let me put, put my finger behind it the point will just be barely barely compromised and i'll just get i just have a little cheap uh, sharpening stone for my knife and I just rub it on there a couple times and just to straighten it out and it gets good nuts. Um, I never pull it out of a, I never get a brand new hook and sharpen it from the package. I only sharpen whenever the tip just gets compromised like that. Again, most of the time it's from getting snagged on an oyster or some sort of hard structure um, that just compromises the tip and just with a couple, you know, couple swipes it's, it's good to go not quite as good as new, as new but good enough um so it's it's not a total lost cause but but yeah i think a lot of these a lot of these hook points um that are made just like chemically made however the heck they do it it's hard to compete with the the what comes out of the factory you know when you do it yourself it's it's just not going to be what it was so if it's just a hook i just i just get a brand new hook and it's only like what I don't know how much a hook is, probably fifty cents or something. Well, where? For like a dollar, right? For these nice hooks. Uh, it's not that much. Either way, if I'm going after usually I'm using live bait, I'm going after big fish, like trophy fish, and I just do not want to miss I don't want to miss a trip a fish of a lifetime by just not putting a good hook on there. So let's in terms of price, I mean that like that owner, I mean those are what a dollar and a quarter, right? Or more? So yeah, you're right actually. 
Yeah, so uh, this was a four pack for three ninety nine. So this is this is a stink of dollar. I never did the math. Yeah, but what's a dollar when you're using a fifteen dollar lure? True. I, I mean, it's, I, I just don't use fifteen dollar lures. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's definitely worth it to you know go with the manufacturer that's going to make the better hook. We were talking. This is an owner hook on my right hand. Uh, I guess on the screen it's my left hand. And this is a laser sharp. I don't know exactly who makes laser sharp, but uh, I mean, I, I got these from my Pompano rigs. You can see on the tip. I mean, I don't know if it's actually going to pick up the focus, but the the owner hook has a much sharper and cleaner. Like Mark was saying, you know, they bevel it perfectly. This laser sharp hook, you know, the hook point. This is straight out of the pack. I ha I haven't even fished these hooks yet. It's kind of dull. It's like chippy. The the barb is all grainy. It's it's not as nice as this owner hook is here. And I probably paid more for less hooks in this owner pack than I did with the laser sharps. But I, I know that I'm going to have better penetration with this hook because it's sharper. Um, it's stronger. It's been made better. And I find that these ones here, you know, they're going to rust a lot faster too. Like I said, with the nickel plated coating, it's, it's just worth it, you know, in the long run, I think to go spend a little bit of extra money and have higher quality hooks that are going to last longer too. So it's, that's just my two cents on the, the It'll be cool. I, I saw uh, in one of those books, they, um, they put different hooks, different brand hooks, and they put them underneath the microscope, like a legit one that you can see chlorophyll and stuff with. And it was crazy, the difference. And like some of them were like surgical, they look like literally surgical needles. And some of them look like the, the something that you like, man, that thing can't even hurt me. It's not even going to penetrate my skin. It was wild when you zoomed in on it that close. Yeah. And, and so I, uh, when I, I've been doing a lot of shrimp fishing around, like for sheep's head and snapper and stuff around bridges where I'm just like literally bouncing it down on all sorts of structure. I can't Eagle see it. Claw. Yeah. So for that, I bring out the Eagle claws. <laughs> I and knew so it. just, just as a price comparison, this was, I believe this pack was nine. Uh, it was either, I think it was 99 cents or $1.99 for eight. So we're not talking dollar hooks here. And, uh, and the reason why I like it is because it's good enough. And it's weak enough so that when I do get snagged, I can just rip it out. You know, I can, I, tr when I'm trying to break the line, in many cases, the hook will just straighten out. <laughs> I get everything back. Yeah. His pliers bend it back and now I'm ready to rock. That's terrible. It works. It works. I've, I've caught, I've caught some legit, I've, I've been catching some legit fish with this. You know, the, um, those, yeah. like, those are freshwater hooks? Like, or does, yeah. Or is it all purpose? All purpose. <laughs> <laughs> AKA freshwater. It says it right there. Cat, catfish specials. Ah, it says it right there. Yes, it's on the, it's on the, it's on the hook, so you know it's it's got to be right. But it, it works. It gets the job done. What is yeah. the average lifetime of a single hook out of that pack, Luke? Um, you mean having like one cast? No, I mean, <laughs> multiple trips. No, yeah, stuff works as long as you uh, rinse it off with fresh water, and it's good. Like, I don't know why you guys are bashing eagle claws. <laughs> No, Eagle Claw's high end stuff. I mean, you look at the like the Trocar. I mean, Trocar is another big, big name coming out on the on the scene. I mean, they're huge on the freshwater side. Yeah, their their jig heads are solid. I've tried some. Yeah. Of them. Um, yeah. yeah, just go go with what you feel comfortable with, right? But these these are one hundred percent not as sharp as the more expensive ones. Uh, but I'm going after smaller fish. I'm I use in braided line. There's no stretch to it. I'm actively fishing. I'm setting the hook. And, and I've been, I've been really, I've been like actually really happy with it. I'm not, and I'm not you're, happy. and you're bouncing it off structure on the bottom and you're going to lose quite a few. And yeah. Matter. And I know that it, I'm more than likely going to get snagged. And again, I prefer the weaker hook in that instance, because in many cases it'll come out straightened first, first breaking, breaking off my leader. Um, I did see a question come in here. What was it? Oh yeah. Who makes that crab? That was the crab that I held up. It's made by uh, Chase Bates. It's called the crusty crab. I, I did a detailed review of it. And uh, you can check that. Just go to just Google search Krusty Crab Review, and you should see it. Do we have them on our shop page still? We did. Uh, I don't know what the inventory levels are because of the pandemic, but we yeah, we did. Yeah, and if you guys don't know, uh, and I know a few of you have mentioned on, on our shop page at shop.saltron.com that you know uh, we're out of a bit of things. And yeah, it's, it's industry-wide, nationwide, it's nuts. Uh, I saw that picture of an academy sports. I mean, it looked like a hurricane season at Publix. There was just nothing there. 
Uh, I've seen some Bass Pros where, I mean, they're just sold, like it's just empty in, uh, in, in many of the, of the aisles. So it's a, it's a nationwide thing. Like even, you know, we, we do some stuff with Z-Man, as you guys know, and we order quite a bit of those jig heads that we've shown on there. And I believe they use all Mustad. Like, you know, Mustad, they were slow because they were waiting on someone else, you know, and it's just like everyone's waiting on someone and it's just slowed this entire train down. It's, it's really, really, really nuts. Uh, good news is it appears to be getting better. Uh, we just got a big order today in. Uh, we got a couple more coming, so you'll see a lot more new stuff on, uh, on the shop page. And, of course, Insider members save 20%, baby. Whoop, whoop. Um, what else, guys? What, are, what else do we have to cover here? I see we're already at uh, 4 o'clock. Yeah, I have one. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it, but um, you probably can't even see it. I mean, uh, looks looks like an old trailer hook. Yeah, do you see it has it has the little spikes on the on the actual shank? It's, yeah. uh, I think it's called a bait keeper or something. Do you guys? What's it called? And that yeah, one, it's a, it's it's a bait keeper. keeper. Yeah, they drive me crazy. I, so I um, I accidentally bought this when I was trying to get my my cheap plane shanks. And I've cut myself so many times where I forget I'm using, I reach down to unhook the fish and it starts thrashing and now I get these little barbs in my hand. So do you guys use these at all? One scenario, I use them. I grew up fishing on the Chesapeake and one of the most popular forms of bait up there is blood worms. So not, there's not many forms of live bait that you know, you're gonna be putting on the actual shank of the hook and you're gonna be running up that far. Blood worms, you know, I thread them pretty much all the way through the hook. So there, that's the one scenario, and it was actually Eagle Claw. I'll completely admit I'm using Eagle Claw bait keeper hooks. Don't be ashamed of Eagle Claw, man. They got good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I grew up fishing with, man, was those Eagle Claw snelled um, bait keeper hooks using blood worms on them. And I'd catch, you know, the mess out of some croaker and some spot and perch using those things because it keeps them on the hook. And those fish, you know, they peck and pull. And uh, those things keep them right there. I, lo I love those for specific species, especially if I'm using, you know, blood worms. For I thought that was how they got their name. I, th I thought it was worm keeper because it it's meant for those old school, old stinky worms to put them up there. They're not going to come down. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't own any of those personally. <laughs> yeah, I was in, I was in a hurry the other day and I thought I was getting my, my favorite uh, plane shanks and uh, grabbed the wrong one. It's probably yeah. one column over. The, 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 that's the old liver holder for catfish, Luke. <laughs> so, okay. but no, the, the, the straight shank just like that though. They're great mackerel hooks that don't have that bait, you know, that bait holder, that longer shank, like that. Yeah, at least it only cost me uh, ninety nine cents. I'm sure, so no problem. Okay. Trying to think what other hooks we have here. Um, as far as size too, I think one important thing to to note to to make note of is that a, a lot of the size selection, at least for me, and uh, Patricia, you all saw it, so I, I spend more focus on the size of my hook compared to the size of the bait that I'm using, compared to, um, I guess more so than the size of the fish I'm targeting. The size of the fish I'm targeting, I'm looking, if I'm targeting a tarpon, I want a, you know, a hook that's strong enough to hold it. But if I'm using a small crab, I don't want a seven knot hook sticking out of a small little crab. I just want to find a strong hook that's like a size, I don't know, size like a one odd or one. Um, so I think a big, a big, a big mistake a lot of people make, and I did it for many years, is that I would, I would, tar I would use a hook if I was targeting big snook, for instance, with little small shrimp. I will be using like a five odd hook, and uh, and that's just dragging around. I'm sure Peter will probably show this underwater, but it, that that hook is just so heavy that it's driving. Um, it's it's not enabling the live bait to act normally and it's going to hinder the amount of strikes you get yeah so in a sentence match the hook to the bait not the fish match the hook to the bait you're using and presenting not the fish you're targeting well, well you still need to think about the fish you're targeting uh, so you can't totally disregard it it just you just need to put a little bit more focus on the bait All right because using a small little crab you're hooking a tarpon with a little small thin wire hook it's game over you're going to come close to catching it well you might jump them still <laughs> I can't one jump, but yeah, so that's super important. Um, trying what else I have. Looking at my tackle box, I think we covered it. Yeah, we could do a whole separate one on just going down light bait, just jig heads. I know, uh, I know, there's some other uh, other questions in here that we'll have to get uh, get back to. But yeah, we're out of time. That was good. 
Um, let us know what else you guys want. I know we heard some stuff about, you know, kayak fishing and even kayak versus boating. Uh, we've heard a, a lot of stuff about different brands. Uh, you know, we're, we're unbiased. We're not sponsored by any of them. So let us know, shoot us a message or put a, put a little comment down. Let us know what you guys want to talk about. And of course, if you're listening to this to the podcast, which I know many, many of you are, uh, hit us up at uh, support at saltstrong.com or fish at saltstrong.com. It'll all come to us one way or the other. And uh, let us know what topics, questions, et cetera, or even species you want us to go target next. Other than that, Marky Mark, Funky Bunch, Wyatt, and the Barking Dog, and uh, Luke, this has been fun. Good times. I guess. Peace. Thanks, guys. We out. See ya.